Hey everyone, so I have Dr. Tina Pierce back on with me today, who is a MCAS specialist, and uh, we did our uh, interview a few months ago, and it's really taken off. People really have a lot of interest, uh, especially with long haul COVID, mast cell issues. Uh, we touched on spike protein, which also gathered a lot of interest. Um, so I thought I'd get Dr. Piers back on and get some updates from her. Um, and Dr. Piers, I do want to get into spike protein stuff that we talked about before, but I'm hoping if you could just give us a bit of a recap, what is MCAS? What is mast cell activation syndrome? Right. So very, I'm very, very happy to be on your show again. Thank you very much for inviting me, Scott. Um, so mast cell activation syndrome is where the um, about 17% of the population have this condition. So it's very underdiagnosed and untreat undertreated. Um, it is a genetic condition where people have slightly abnormal mast cells. So they are hyper uh, hyper reactive and they react to things that normally they should just be ignoring, but they don't ignore them. Various chemical stimuli, um, et cetera, that will stimulate the mast cells to fire off and release over a thousand different cytokines. Now, these cytokines are um, very potent. Um, there, we don't even know what some of them do, um, but we do know some of them, like histamine, and some of them are very pro-inflammatory, like um, interleukin one, one beta six, eight, uh, etc., thirteen, um, and uh, and. Uh, heparin, which causes bruising, uh, elastase 2, which breaks down membranes. So we do know what some of them do. It, and when somebody has, sorry, I'm rambling a bit here, aren't I? But <laughs> um, when somebody has mast cell activation syndrome, uh, their mast cells, which are everywhere in the body, can um, release these cytokines into the tissues, which then subsequently cause inflammation. And because they are everywhere, they're under the skin, they're lining the sinuses, nasal passages, oropharynx, in, lining the gut, uh, the bladder, the vagina, they, they're just everywhere. Um, if they are releasing inflammatory cytokines into those areas, you can then get symptoms in all of those areas. And these symptoms are variable. They can vary from person to person and they can vary from time to time in the same person um, and usually result in things, syndromes like IBS, um, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, chronic headaches, hives, urticaria, food intolerances, um, and so on, and uh, chronic migraine. Yeah, so we see a lot of patients in a lot of different specialties will have this condition and be presenting to that specialist um, POTS, 80% of the people who suffer from MCAS are female, 80% have hypermobility, 30% um, have interstitial cystitis. Yeah, so it's a very interesting area. It's not so interesting if you suffer from it, <laughs> um, because often for patients will have seen many, many, many different physicians and um, uh, healthcare professionals and have got very few answers. Right. I could tell you, I check off a lot of those boxes, except for the female. I seem to be one of the unlucky males, but you know, I have chronic pelvic pain syndrome, which is you sort of swap with interstitial cystitis, uh, yeah. terrible sinus issues, IBS, you name it, I got it. Mm. Um, so how does this relate to conditions? Let's start with long haul COVID. Okay. Because obviously getting COVID itself could really set off your mast cells and create this sort of uh, this cascade of mast cell activation, but also from the vaccine itself. So can you maybe get into those? Because that seems to be a huge area of interest for people. Yes. So if um, if you've got 17% of the population who have these overreactive mast cells, um, then 17% of people who catch COVID are going to overreact to the COVID infection. And they may be the ones who get into real difficulty with it and have hyperinflammation, which then gives them a whole load of other symptoms together with the symptoms that were caused by COVID. Um, so the treatment for acute COVID actually is very similar. What's well, the same as treating MCAS. So um, I realized in the spring of 2020 how to treat acute COVID um, and it's with vitamins and minerals. So um, things like uh, magnesium and selenium and vitamin C, vitamin D, um, zinc, very important, um, quercetin, which everyone can buy over the, over the counter or on the internet, which is a mast cell stabilizer and antihistamines. 
Um, so taking loratadine or cetirizine, 10 milligrams, three or four times a day. This can really, really help improve um, the symptoms from COVID very quickly. I also advise my patients to have a low histamine diet whilst they are suffering with COVID, um, to do lots of nasal washes with normal saline um, or iodine in, in, drop, in water, drops of iodine in water would work because it's very um, antiseptic. So washing out your nasal passages every few hours, um, doing gargles as well um, every few hours, especially in the initial part of the infection, any viral infection, upper respiratory, you want to do that because in the initial phases, the virus goes into a replication stage and that's when you want to really get it out of you as much as possible. So those are the simple things. Now we've realized that patients who had acute COVID responded very well to this treatment. Um, and then I realized that patients with long COVID sounded exactly like my mast cell activation patients with the same uh, profile of symptoms. And therefore, in theory, they should respond very well to the same treatments. And lo and behold, when I opened my long COVID clinic on the 1st of November, 2020, that's exactly what I found that 98, 99% of these patients had a previous history of untreated, undiagnosed mast cell activation syndrome, which was then made much worse and activated by the, um, by the virus and left them with these symptoms and with this, um, this syndrome, uh, with all the you know, multiple symptoms, ME, POTS, et cetera, et cetera. And they respond very, very well to the same treatments. Um, so that's, that's really encouraging. So we've been making a lot of people very much better who have long COVID with a uh, low histamine diet. There's an excellent website called whatthebleepcaneat.com to get the low histamine and the um, histamine free food list from, and that's about 200 foods, to stick to that diet as much as possible. No leftovers, no processed foods, um, everything as organic as possible, um, and to take uh, type one antihistamines and to take some type two antihistamines, um, such as formotidine or, or uh, nizatidine um, and a mast cell stabilizer such as ketotifen. Um, if you have a lot of gut symptoms to take nalcron, which is sodium chromoglycate, that's a very useful um, mast cell stabilizer for the gut. Uh, and low dose naltrexone can be very helpful as well. Um, so we do all of those things for these patients. Now, not everything works in everybody, but different things will work in different people. And you have to be patient and just gently go through each one, trialing it for a few weeks. And if it works, keep it. If it doesn't work, stop it and try something else. So that's that's sort of the long COVID side of things. And then we found that some of our long COVID patients were getting better and then they were having the vaccination and that was setting them back. Um, and then as scientists studied this more and more, they found the pathophysiology of the spike protein wasn't very good. And that therefore the spike protein can be a big trigger to the mast cell activation syndrome. And in MCAS, um, one of the principles of treatment is to get rid of all of the triggers. And the triggers could be perfumes, chemicals, Wi-Fi, so EMFs. It could be a vi the virus. It could be um, glandular fever being reactivated. It could be mold. Please, if you have uh, ever been exposed to mold in your life, you need to have mycotoxin tests. You need to have the mycotoxins cleared out of your system because unfortunately they stay there forever, really. So you have to clear them out actively. And all of those things will be triggering mast cell activation and the spike protein is a big trigger for mast cell activation. So again, we have been working very hard on how to get that out of the body. And, um, and one of the big, um, most um, useful uh, things to use is augmented NAC. Now, ordinary NAC is excellent to take, um, 600 milligrams a day, N-acetylcysteine, it's a very good supplement can't be made by the body, but is really essential. It's a very good antioxidant. Um, but a very uh, wonderful team of scientists in Italy discovered that if they mixed NAC with the spike protein, it denatured maybe 2%, 3%, 5% of the spike protein, but then the envelope of the spike protein reformed afterwards. Um, and But if they augmented the NAC using quantum physics on it, altering it at the subatomic level, 
um, they could make all of the molecules of the uh, NAC do that. And therefore, it would denature 99.8% of the extracellular spike protein. The liver is then able to clear it out and you pee it out in your urine, uh, which is absolutely brilliant. Now, um, because the spike protein that the, the injections have set up in our bodies to be made um, by hijacking our ribosomes, which is the protein making mechanism of the cell. So instead of making the proteins we need, we become deficient in those and we're making this spike protein. And because it's never been in the human body in the whole of evolution, our body doesn't know how to clear it out. So it's really important, and I can't emphasize this enough, everyone who has had either COVID or the vaccine, please, please, please get some augmented NAC. Take one three times a day for three months if you've been vaccinated. If you've just had COVID, I would take one twice a day for three months. And then after that, take one a day because it, you will continue to make the spike protein and you really want to get rid of it as fast as you're making it. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack there. I'm going to ask you some, <laughs> some pretty tough questions. Um, first off, something that a lot of people ask me, and this this might, I know you're not a scientist, so this might be above your pay grade in that level. How do they augment NAC? You say quantum physics. Oh, do you wow. know a little bit more detail about that? <laughs> It is fascinating. So um, I don't know how they do it, um, but it's quantum physics and it's quantum medicine that we're dealing with here, which is a, a whole big area that I think is going to develop over the next few years. So the they said that if some of the molecules, some of the atoms of the NAC have got this ability to affect the um, the spike protein in that way. It's something about the way they're vibrating and the way the position of the electrons and neutrons and the atoms uh, in within the atoms. So if you can duplicate that and make all of the atoms like that, all of the molecules of the NAC like that, which they do with a quantum machine, then they will all have that potential and they can all do it. And that's exactly what they found. So I'm sorry, that's as far as my explanation can go, okay. but it is fascinating. Mm. And what do you see just from your own practice? I know you probably don't measure, you know, you don't have charts of like, you know, success rate, but what do you see as a success rate in, just in general? Is this okay. something so, that generally works for the, the greater people that yes. you treat? Or? Yes, yes. Yeah. I find that people are feeding back and saying their brain fog is, is better. They have more clarity of thought. They have um, fewer aches and pains. Uh, there are all sorts of, of, of stories coming back from patients. One patient had um, a history of arthritic sort of joint type pains, but um, uh, these had got worse in particular over the last year. And she has had two vaccines. And when she took the NAC, she found that actually all of her joints massively improved she also this woman had some t some funny dizzy spells suddenly occurring which was very disconcerting because she was worrying about driving and um and uh when she was seen they couldn't find a reason for it and all the rest of it and i said well i think it could be the spike that's doing that to you uh so let's see what happens when you have the ordinary nac the augmented nac and certainly it has dramatically reduced the um the frequency of the dizzy spells and the length of time that they go on for and actually i don't think she's had some one for a couple of months now so as her levels have come down she's um clearing it out of her system everything is getting back more to normal uh, i think it's it's so important for us to do this because we do know that the spike um actually is very detrimental to our t lymphocytes it causes something like uh, to syncytia formation which means that we are immunosuppressed and um actually if you can clear the spike then the new t lymphocytes that will be made will be healthy and our immune systems will bounce back so i think that's another thing people are saying that prior to taking the augmented nac they were getting a lot of infections a lot of chest infections throat infections sore throat sinusitis etc and then after taking it they now don't get lots of infections, they feel that their immune system has recovered, which is very gratifying. So yeah, I, I'm very um, heartened by um, by the um, success really. Um, and actually this afternoon, I took some to a friend who I'm very con dearly concerned about um, because she has suddenly got short-term memory loss. 
post-vaccination and um, we are expecting prion disease um, in a lot more people as a result of the lipid nanoparticle in particular. And um, so I am I'm praying and hoping that the augmented NAC that I've taken to her will improve her memory and improve some of what, um, yeah, what's been happening for her. Perfect. Yeah. Um, what is the general timeline that you see people starting to recover? Um, can be very, very quickly, very quickly. Mm -hmm. So they, they did some studies in Italy and they found that the, um, that they've checked, the, they've got a urine test where they can see the metabolites of the spike protein in the urine. And um, they tested people before they took the augmented NAC and there were none, there were no metabolites in the urine. So the body was not dealing with this. And then on day eight, after taking it three times a day for eight days, they found plenty in the urine. So that's a good sign that it's working. And then they checked them every week um, to see when it started to, to reduce, to show that actually they'd got on top of it and it took about three months. But then we are, as I say, we are suggesting that it's really important for people to continue to take it because they will be making it still. And in fact, there was a two weeks ago, there was um, a group, an expert um, meeting of a meeting of experts from all over the world. Um, and they said that in 13 different laboratories globally, they had analyzed some of the injections and they all had some DNA in them. So that's very concerning and being contaminated with DNA. So we therefore theoretically could be making the spike protein forever. <laughs> so we need to, um, until we know how to repair the DNA, we need to clear it out. Okay. Now, just anecdotally <clears throat> speaking, on my channel, I've had a bunch of people reach out to me saying that they've taken the augmented NAC already. And uh, the majority of those people, uh, in fact, a guy just reached out to me yesterday saying that he saw tremendous benefits from it. Now, there was one person that reached out to me and was saying, what the heck is this? Um they were they are hyper hyper reactive to okay. supplements and stuff like that and uh she said that she had a a horrible flare for about a month yeah um, when she was taking it so so uh, do you know what might be going on in those cases yes. do you sort of see that opposite reaction so what, what can happen with anyone with mcas is they can be super sensitive to anything and um, sometimes it's excipients and things that are within the um, the supplement or the medication and not the actual med active part of the medication or supplement that's the problem. And what I always suggest if when I've got, and you know, some of my patients are super sensitive like that. So I always say to them, just go low and slow with everything. Please, please open the capsule, get out the powder, pop it in some liquid, take a little bit of it, see how you are. If you're okay with that, then as your body gets used to it, the next day, maybe a little bit more and the next day, a little bit more. So you're not going to go straight in with one, three times a day. Um, and I suggest that people do one a day for a few days. If they're okay with that, then make it one twice a day. If they're okay with that, then go to one, three times a day. Now, um, I'm also asking my patients to take ordinary NAC, 600 milligrams a day, plus activated charcoal for seven days or two weeks before they start the augmented NAC to do a liver detox, to actually clean out the, lev the liver from all the toxins and heavy metals, et cetera, that we store in our livers. Because you're going to ask your liver to work really quite hard once you start taking the augmented NAC. So you want to have a nice clean liver to start with. The other thing I always warn my patients about is that they can have a detox reaction. Um, and certainly um, I, I had a detox reaction um, and some of my family members have one family member after taking it for 24 hours. And we didn't do the uh, activated charcoal and the augment and the ordinary NAC for two weeks before to clean our livers. We didn't, we just went straight in with the, with the um, augmented NAC because we were so keen to get on with it. And one family member woke up after 24 hours with a headache, which he never does. And then after breakfast, he had to sort of actually go back to bed because he felt so rough. And that lasted about four hours. And what he should have been doing is drinking lots of water um, to clean it out of his system. After about four hours, he rallied, had a late lunch. Mid-afternoon was fine and actually was fine in the evening. By the evening, absolutely fine, tickety-boo, no problem. I had a detox reaction on day six, 
and um and it was very strange i was in the middle of a clinic and i suddenly felt that my face i felt really hot i thought god it's hot in here my face was getting redder and redder and redder and it was feeling really prickly and hot and uncomfortable and then my neck was like that and it lasted about 36 hours and then it just went and when i spoke to the italian team they said yes that's a detox people detox in different ways my daughter felt like she had flu for 12 hours when she had it um okay in- early on so so push through it uh, another friend felt fluey and i said to her push through push through and she's so glad she did because now she says and she didn't have the vaccine but she did have covid and also was shed upon by people who'd had the vaccine and she said she's now she's got more clarity of thought her words are better etc so she's got more energy she's really pleased she pushed through it Okay. And there have been other supplements that have been studied to show some effectiveness. I've had a lot of people ask me questions about that. There's uh, natokinase. I'm sorry if I did not pronounce that correctly. Uh, Curacetin, bromelain. Um, yeah. Some people are even doing mega doses of vitamin C. Yes. Um, have you heard of this? And, and what do you make of these other supplements? Yes, no, they, they all have a place um, and they all can contribute uh, to a lesser or greater degree, uh, but none of them do it quite like the augmented NAC. You know, that actually denatures 99.8% of the extra spe- uh, so extracellular spike protein. So that one is more potent, but we've also found that the augmented NAC augments vitamin C and vitamin D and actually makes them more effective in the body than they were on their own. So that's very interesting. So that's some quantum physics going on there where it's actually affecting it, you know, these other supplements and improving their efficacy. So um, yes, there are lots of uh, different ways. Um, the um, And, you know, we, we encourage people to increase autophagy because that's switched off by the spike. So that's intermittent fasting, resveratrol, 500 milligrams twice a day, um, uh, cold showers, um, if you can manage it, um, this all, these all increase autophagy, which is ex- an, an excellent thing to do uh, to counteract the effects. Um, yeah, so there's there's lots of different things one can do, and it's important for people to do all of these. The other thing that I've been finding, um, if it's okay, I'll move on to something sure. um, that I want to pass on, and that is that um, if people have POTS type symptoms. So uh, heart rate goes up when they stand up or um, blood pressure drops and all this sort of thing, dizziness, then it's worth thinking about um, their blood sugars. And some people have bought little blood sugar monitors and just do a finger prick test and see what their blood sugar is when they're feeling like that. Now, some patients are telling me that when they feel like that, they check their blood sugar and it's actually one. So it's too low. And uh, they're having a hypoglycemic attack, effectively. Um, And um, there are ways that you can prevent those attacks. They realize that it's happening after food, after certain meals, et cetera, after they've eaten certain things, okay? So the food is is important. Now, there's a a woman called the um, glucose goddess. I don't know if people have come across her, but I think she's on Instagram, the glucose goddess, and she's written a book. And... um, and she and I can't remember her name. I'm so sorry. But um, she she recommends that uh, people should start every single meal with salad. Just like they do in France. So start with salad, have, you know, cress, salad leaves, um, flat leaf parsley before you eat the rest of your meal. So you have the salad, then you have protein, eat in a specific order, then you eat the protein, then you eat the fat, then you eat the carbohydrate, and only then you have sugar. And that will slow the sugar absorption down and mean that you do not have these hyper and hypoglycemic attacks. Um, And people have found that they can completely eliminate their POTS symptoms by doing this something as simple as that. Now, also, um, if they have low blood sugar, don't reach for sugar. That's the worst thing you can do. What you need to do is take liposomal vitamin C um, in quite good doses, like six, seven milligrams, uh, grams, and also and um, MCT oil, a tablespoon or two of MCT oil, and that will bring your blood sugar up gradually over 20 minutes which is a much more stable way of doing it because you don't really want to take sugar and then go too high and then it goes too low and so on. You you end up being 
just feeding the pots really. That's very interesting. You know, I myself, um, as I've mentioned, you know, it's part of this channel is suffering from mast cell activation syndrome, something I've suffered with now for a greater part of almost seven years. And uh, carbs and sugars destroy me. And, and I, you're spot on with that. If I start with carbs or sugars at all, uh, two hours later, I feel like I'm dying. Um, I get terrible, terrible reaction. I feel like I can't even move. My legs don't work. Everything is brain fog up up to wazoo. Um, so would you recommend then maybe if people could tolerate it, maybe doing a ketogenic type diet to help with some like a low histamine ketogenic type diet? Uh, absolutely. I think ketogenic diets are incredible. I'm hearing more and more patients reporting that they're getting absolutely fabulous results from ketogenic diets. If you can do it, then go for it. I think it, you know, we would um, certainly not have all the type two diabetes. Um, people lose weight very quickly. I've known of somebody, somebody lost four stone in about four months, literally from just going on a ketogenic diet. So they weren't calorie restricting. They were just changing what they were eating and the way they were eating. Um, so this is incredibly powerful. I think we are probably supposed to be ketogenic uh, naturally, you know, evolutionary way. Um, we're supposed to be eating a paleo ketogenic diet. And, um, and certainly it's a very good way to reverse some metabolic diseases. So, yes, I think that's something um, that could be very, very powerful. And remember the order in which you eat things and start with a salad. And let's Absolutely. see. Let's see. Yeah, I'd be really interested to hear what your your um your view viewers, you know, what the feedback is from from doing that. Yeah, I'm fairly low carbohydrate, but I do eat, have to have some carbs sometimes. Um, it's yeah. kind of weird. It's like I can't live with them. I can't live without them. So mm -hmm. um, I will try that order next time. I will. Maybe I'll have some kale and then some protein, and then yeah. maybe I'll move yeah. on to squash or something. Yeah, um, absolutely. Good, good. Yeah, um, and. So let's talk about, I, I, well, first I want to talk about like what is sort of the prognosis of MCAS and what, what we could do exactly beyond what you've mentioned already. But um, what are some other sort of natural methods that we could take? Augmented NAC, a lot of people on our channel are very adverse to trying anything in the medical world. They don't want to see their doctor. They don't want to be on medications. Um, is there anything else that you would recommend? You've mentioned fasting. You've mentioned uh, certain supplements, natural supplements that we could take. Is there anything else you'd, you'd recommend on that front? Yes. So grounding. Grounding is really, really good for us. We should all be going outside three or four times a day and touching the soil with our bare hands or our bare feet. So um Grounding. why is that get grounding mats you can get you know i've got a grounding mat underneath my uh my keyboard so when my hands rest on that um so because the body is full of negative electrons we love we are actually all electricity we're we're two million volts walking around attached to a few cells and um and we love negative electrons and we dissipate them with stress and um, even apparently driving in a soft top car, it, it blows away your negative electrons. So you want to constantly be replenishing them and the earth replenishes them for us. The earth is full of negative electrons and it will give you a free gift if you just touch it. And you know how fast an uh, electric current flows along a wire? Well, it's as fast as that. If you touch the ground, you are completely, you know, sort of uh, recharged with negative electrons, and then your homeostasis will be much better. Your your uh, the balance of the biochemistry will be much better. So, and that's one of the principles that the um, arc machine um, works on. And this little device, I don't, I think I spoke about it before. This is a a little mm -hmm. electric device that gives you a microcurrent for three hours. Here, this is one. This is mine here and you wear it around your ankle or just under your knee or around your arm and uh, try and wear it for three hours a day minimum. Um, and it gives you this microcurrent in different pulses that actually boosts your ATP production three to five fold. Now, um, one of the big problems with MCAS, um, ME, CSF is mitochondrial dysfunction that um, and that's why people feel exhausted and that's why if they do too much one day they might still feel exhausted two days later 
because their mitochondria and the ATP production has not recovered. And um, in each single, each cell, we have 100,000 mitochondria. And we actually need to make and use 70 to 80 kilograms of ATP every single day. And the mitochondria are responsible for making and storing the ATP. So 70 to 80 kilograms a day is more than we weigh, um, some of us. And, uh, and that, so that's a hell of a lot of ATP that needs to be made just to keep us alive. Now, if you're not making enough and you've got some mitochondrial dysfunction because of stress, because of Wi-Fi, 5G, et cetera, then your production isn't going to be optimal and your body's going to have to prioritize and say, well, we have it hasn't got enough ATP, but we'll just do the essential things, but we won't bother with the anti-inflammatory stuff and the healing and repair stuff. <laughs> we'll just do the essentials. And what we need when we've got MCAS, especially and all of us, is for it to do everything. And by boosting your ATP production, you can really help your body to heal itself. And actually putting your hands on the ground is a very similar thing. You're getting the electrons and boosting your ATP production from the earth. So um, I really would recommend that people consider an ARC machine. And that's from arcmicrotech.com. Okay, I'll have to link that in the description. Yeah, have, a, have a link. And um, and actually, yeah, there's a code that gives people a bit of a discount too, which I can give you. So yeah. Uh, yeah. So absolutely. So a lot of the things you mentioned, like resveratrol, fasting, NAC, grounding, I mean, all these things are, are supposedly supposed to be ATP boosters, right? So I'm assuming that, that boosting your ATP is a big part of uh, sending mast yeah. cell into remission. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the other thing we need to do is remember to feed ourselves properly. So um, there's another um, new mineral that I love my patients to go on, and it's called Life Minerals. Um, you get it from lifeminerals.co.uk. And it's actually um, a liquid, blue liquid. You take 15 mils a day. And this is marvelous for people who have irritable bowel, um, inflamed bowel, leaky gut, etc. And, and maybe have some absorption difficulties because it's a liquid it's absorbed really really easily and it contains 70 different essential minerals and trace elements so this wow. is incredible absolutely incredible so um uh, i've um some of my patients find it very difficult to digest food and to absorb the foods because they've got so much gut inflammation but when they take this they they start to replenish give the body some of the fuel that it needs yeah absolutely okay well that could be something i could probably use you know i yeah. i get a lot of people on this channel that suffer from severe restless leg syndrome uh just myself and uh muscle fatigue and so on and so forth um i find that uh a lot of like you said it has gut inflammation i i um find fasting has helped me tremendously with that but uh i'm definitely looking for other methods yeah. uh you know it's to absorb foods better and yeah so that's yeah, great definitely. the other thing i'd like people to look out for is their thyroid function so um it's very important that people should know what their latest tsh is thyroid stimulating hormone now their doctors will tell them that it's normal as long as it's below five in the uk you may have a slightly different um grading. i think it's four here is it okay so i think yeah. it's, it's 4.9 here so so but you really want it to be below 1.5 so if your TSH is above 1.5, then you really think you should be trying to do something about your thyroid. And um, and you don't need a doctor to help you with that. You can do it yourself. Um, there is something called thyroid natural glandular. And there's another, another um, pors that's a bovine one. And a pors porcine one is Metavive. And these are actually um, thyroid supplements. <clears throat> and your body just takes what it needs from them. And that can make a huge difference, a huge difference uh, to energy levels, to weight management, to um, metabolism. <clears throat> yeah. Right. Okay. So I'm getting this great overall picture here. There's so much involved with mast cell activation. I think a lot of people's heads are swimming right now, but there's a lot of good, good information here. And I think a lot of it also has to do with, uh, in terms of really setting off symptoms, sleep, lifestyle, not getting any exercise, being around, um, uh, what's it called? Electro EMFs all day, um, which there is a study on that as well. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, there is a bigger picture here, right? I think what you're trying to get at, I think for most people is that it's not as simple as maybe just doing one thing. It has to be a multifaceted treatment. Is that your approach? Absolutely. And it's about being as healthy as you possibly can be. So it's about, you know, eating organic food, no processed food, re- freshly prepared food. It's about um, it's about grounding. It's about positive um, mindset. It's about, um, it, you know, a lot of people with MCAS can't do uh, cardiac type exercise, but they can do weight exercise. And I, I encourage people to do weights because there's no reason to be not, not to be fit and to be muscular and to be, you know, keep your core strength going. But if you do weights, you're not going to be straining and getting the cardiac um uh, sort of hit afterwards that exhausts you so um and you know so, and it's about pacing as well you know it's about making sure that you know your limits you don't overdo it i have lots of patients who feel so much better and they're so thrilled and then they just go all out and they have a mega busy summer and then then they crash a little bit you know because they've just done a little bit too much so be mindful be mindful about your activities what you're doing stress what you're you know be kind to yourself look after yourself Um, have good sleep. Um, That's very important. Getting outside, important to um, get out as early as you wake up, try and go out and see the sun rising, or the, you know, getting some of that light hitting the back of your eye to help with Mm -hmm. the melanin in production which helps with your circadian rhythm if you can at lunchtime nip out again touch the ground have a look at the brightest part of the sky without looking directly at the sun um, and then do it again in the evening and your body will get the the whole rhythm of life you know we we're part of nature we need to tap into that really um and you know try and have some fun try and have distract yourself with friends and family and doing things you enjoy thinking about things you enjoy uh, especially at this time <laughs> we've got to make sure that we we don't get too um, distracted by everything that's going on and we remember the good things in life. Hmm. And what about uh, something we haven't touched on and s- some people might find this odd because it's kind of what the whole channel is about, um, like brain retraining, like limbic system training, right? Um, I find that a lot of people get enveloped in this identity of chronic illness and it becomes a, a obsession and it's rightfully so because they're feeling the symptoms every day. I get that. But um, this has been studied and we've seen just in our own community, a lot of people um, just, you know, seeing massive improvements once they start the limbic system, brain retraining, uh, calming down the nervous system. Is that something that you employ in your own practice? And do you see good results with that? Definitely, definitely. I get people reporting about a 30% improvement in their symptoms just by doing that, which is very significant, very significant. So, you know, if we can get... Uh, sometimes we achieve sort of 70, 80 percent improvement with uh, medication and lifestyle changes. But then to do the limbic retraining can just be, you know, the, the absolutely brilliant. So definitely this is something that we run alongside uh, the rest, really. Um, it's hugely important. Yeah. And I mean, you're the expert in that, but definitely find it recommended to my patients. Yeah. And the ones who see it through and the ones who do it definitely benefit from it. Yeah, yeah, and I know Gupta did recently did a study, and they saw some some pretty amazing improvements in in their um, subjects. So um, now this is kind of a little bit controversial. Um, can MCAS be completely um, eliminated? Can somebody eliminate, or is it something that you mentioned? So there's a genetic component, like. Is it something that you just send into remission and something you just have to live with the rest of your life and you just have to be careful with living a certain lifestyle and so on and so forth? Like, what's your idea on that? So I've seen I've seen both. I've seen people who have it. it's quite complex. And I think those who have got a very high um, influence from mold exposure, for example, um, so they have it's epigenetic in them. So they, they've probably got pretty good normal mast cells, but because of the mycotoxin exposure, they have become um, activated and hyperactivated. And if you can treat the, the mold exposure and get rid of the mycotoxins and so on, you can actually really, really get those people back to normal, healthy life as they were before. Um, generally, my patients with MCAS have to learn how to manage their condition, and they but they manage it very well. And that doesn't mean they necessarily stay on medication at all. Um, but they might turn to the medication when they know they've got a flare or they've eaten some of the wrong things because it's Christmas and and all 
all the rest of it. And then they might take some antihistamines again and be good for a little bit and get it all under control. So um, I do have people who say, actually, do you know what? I'm back to normal. I can eat anything now and and I can exercise and I'm just, just a healthy person, no problem. And then there are others who say, well, no, I have to be careful. I know, I know if I overdo it. That So I think there are apparently... Uh, the kit genes, which is where the, um, the the genetic issues can be for the mast cells, there are they've identified fifty different um, kit mutations that can cause this, and I suspect it depends on how many you have and which one you have, and, you know, as to the degree of uh, the severity and the sensitivity that you then you know display with your mast cells. So it's it's a it's an individual journey for everybody. Um, but I do have people who report getting completely back to normal with a normal diet and everything. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. It seems, uh, it seems like some people now, um, one last thing, I, I guess I should have mentioned this before. Um, it seems to be huge segment of people, and this is where my mass cell really went off the charts, um, is drug induced mass cell activation syndrome. So psych meds seem to play a huge, huge, huge role in that, especially when people try to get off of them. So I could tell you for myself, Cymbalta, which is a, a sort of a uh, antidepressant, it's an SNRI, it also works on pain and these different conditions. Um, trying to get off that is absolutely horrendous. Is this something that you've seen with these psychotropic drugs? And is it a huge problem for people with mast cell activation syndrome? It's uh, some some of my patients have been put on SSRIs and things because when they have co um, consulted uh, phys clinicians who haven't quite known what to make of them, um, and these poor patients are low, you know, mood their mood is low because they're not getting any help and they don't feel very well and they don't know what's happening to them. Often they're diagnosed with anxiety and depression. <laughs> And then they're given these SSRIs. And I'm, I'm not keen on any of these drugs. I really try and use minimum amount of drugs possible for people um, for as short as time as possible. And, uh, and then it can be a real issue trying to come off them. And the, the best way that I have heard and found is that you do it very, 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 very slowly. And you literally, you, um, if it's a, if it's a, um, a um a tablet that you've got you literally shave a little bit off it and you ha you make it and every month you shave a little bit more off that tablet so you're having a tiny bit less a tiny bit less a tiny bit less over months so you're going to come off it over a couple of years um and then, and gradually so it takes a lot of patience but it's worth it because that way you can do it whereas if you try you can't certainly go cold turkey and people can't even some people can't, some people can, but some people can't just half the dose and then half the dose and then half the dose and stop. You know, they have to actually be a little bit more subtle than that. Uh, so yes, it's an issue. And uh, I see it a lot in my menopause patients because 80% of the menopause ladies, when they go to their GP with perimenopause symptoms are told they're just depressed and given antidepressants, when actually what they really need is HRT. And they don't get better on the antidepressants, but you give them the HRT and they feel great. So yeah, we see it across the board. Very interesting. And I guess for the last question I have for you, unless you want to add something else at the end, but, um, and, and this, again, we're getting into very controversial territory here. Uh, Big Brother might not like what we're saying so much, so we'll see what happens with this, but I like to leave this as uncensored as possible. Um, we see some stuff popping back up with the COVID news, right? They're talking about, oh, COVID's starting to spike up again. Um, there's some rumor that shutdowns might be happening this winter. Um, and uh, you, if you don't want to comment on it, that's fine. But what's your take on that, if, if, if any? I think that um, they've tried to um, hype up various things in the past, which have come to nothing. Um, right. so I would, uh, keep a very open mind and take everything with a pinch of salt. So do you remember the WHO declared the monkey pox as a pandemic? Yes, um, I do. Yeah. I mean, even the name is silly, isn't it? And we all just laughed and, um, nothing really came of that. So, um, I think just, um, you know, generally what viruses do is they become less virulent and more contagious. 
that's generally what viruses do because they want to survive. And uh, so um, bearing that in mind, then, you know, um, that's what I would expect to happen. I wouldn't be I wouldn't test personally for COVID. It's it's now like other coronaviruses. It's a cold. It's out there. I don't I don't want to know whether I've got that or another cold. I don't think it's important. and I don't think we should be fueling the numbers. Um, so I wouldn't prom I wouldn't promote testing. I wouldn't promote mask wearing because that doesn't work. We know they don't work. And in fact, they're bad for you. Um, we know that, um, you know, um, I would keep away from any uh, further injections because we now know the pathophysiology of those and that they, they don't work because if they did, nobody would need to go and have repeat doses. Um, we wouldn't be seeing so much COVID around, would we? And um, et cetera. So I think be sensible, um, be careful, but and take, take the precautions that I said at the beginning about how to treat it. Um, just, you know, have the stuff in your cupboard ready and um, and let's not panic because it was the panic and hysteria that allowed certain things and policies to be put in place before. Is there anything else you want to add before we let you go today? Uh, no, I think that's probably about it. We covered it. We covered a lot. So, guys, I'm going to do my best to link everything in the in the description below. NAC talk about um, you know some of the order the doctor Pierce suggested that we do things in if we want to help treat uh, MCAS and put it into remission, also uh, dealing with the spike protein. So I'll do my best. If you guys have questions, please look in the description first before you email me <laughs> and before emailing Dr. Piers, okay? Uh, so Dr. Piers, I want to thank you so much. And, and uh, maybe we'll have you back another time if, uh, if we have a, a ton more questions for you. Um, but I really appreciate your time and, and your knowledge and uh, the work that you've been doing. Oh, well, thank you, Scott. I appreciate what you're doing too. Thank you. Thank you.